Hey, hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining our webinar today um, about the new drug testing regulations for 2018 and what employers need to know to be compliant. Uh, this webinar is brought to you by Orange Tree Employment Screening and the presentation will be given by Nina French, managing partner of the current consulting group. Nina has been a longstanding member of the employee screening community, advising clients on drug testing strategy and occupational health and wellness operations. After the presentation, Nina will definitely be able to answer any questions you might have and to continue the conversation. If you could, please raise your hand uh, through the GoToWebinar and we will be sure to unmute you to ask your question. Thank you so much for joining us, Nina. Thank you, thank you for having me and thanks for everybody who's joined today. Um, we have a pretty large audience um, and I sort of use that when I, I speak and, and on behalf of Orange Tree and other clients um, to gauge how much interest and how much confusion there is right now in the world of drug testing. Um, and so we have a lot of information to go through and a lot of it is heavy, right? So it's legislation. And what I try and do is to understand that this audience can rely on Orange Tree to get detailed updates for what you need. Um, you can talk to customer service, you can talk to your sales rep, you can talk to your account manager to get details if you need it. What our intent today is to give you an overview of the new legislation that's passed, to give you some details on the new marijuana laws because they are so complex and changing, um, to give you updates on the HHS and DOT changes and how that's going to impact you give you a little bit of insight into what wackiness we're going to see in 2018, and then we'll leave some room for questions. But we're going to do it so that it applies to all of the attendees today. And I want to just keep re reiterating that, you know, contact Orange Tree if you need some more details, because we're not going to go into extraordinary details of any specific state or law to the extent that you would need if you're an employer in that state and you need to make policy changes or program changes. So that's that's what the team at Orange Tree is there to talk to you about. Um, what I will start with is that 2017 was as active as we predicted it would be. Um, and as a 20, almost five year veteran in employee screening, it is the busiest, most interesting time that I can recall ever in drug testing and in employee screening as a whole. We're seeing all of those things about ban the box. We're seeing things about how we can use all of the new data that we are collecting on, on people to determine if they're good fits within our organization. Um, and you know we're seeing a very complex, tight hiring market. And so it's really interesting for those of us who are in the industry to watch how things are changing, how quickly they're changing, and to work with the employers um, to keep them up to date and to really translate what is oftentimes not um, set, you know, not, not black and white, not set in stone. Translate it so that you can be protected and you can be aware of what's happening. And so, like I said, 2017 was extremely active. We saw 16 medical marijuana laws um, we saw three recreational marijuana laws change. We saw workers' comp laws, drug testing. Um, and as is always the case, um, those that you know are proposed and those that change are different. And so um, we saw that that you know the number of laws that are proposed um, versus the ones that are or, I'm sorry introduced versus the ones that are changed. You know, it's fairly significant. Um, it's changing um, where they're passing a higher percentage each year. Um, and, and we're seeing that with a lot of the marijuana laws that are getting proposed. Um, it's taking two and three times for them to be adjusted before they actually pass. And so you'll see that in the number of bills introduced in the number of bills that pass each year. Um, Drug testing laws that pass, if you were to Google drug testing, um, you would get a significantly different number than, than we've shown on these two screens. 
What we are showing here are the ones that are specifically related to employment drug testing and employment law. Um, we have some that affect welfare law. We have some that affect, you know, synthetic drugs, DUID. What we're not showing here are all of the other drug laws that affect criminal justice, that affect, um, you know, welfare, um, all of the detailed laws. We don't show them here, so you would get more. So this is a focus on the legislation that's passed that affects drug testing. Um, a lot of them, obviously, the highest percentage are related to workers' compensation. Um, I'm sorry, are, are related to marijuana. I said workers' compensation are related to marijuana. But all of the laws sort of have a trickle-down effect and impact one another. And as we go through some of them, you're going to understand. So let's start with some of the ones that are are sort of highly impactful and in a more general sense. They're not specific to marijuana. West Virginia, we saw a mandatory drug testing law pass. Um, and basically what it said is that it's granting protection for employers against civil action. And what it does is says, in West Virginia, as an employer, this mandatory law is going to have certain requirements of you. Many states do not have mandatory laws. And so I pause before I go on, and I want each of the attendees to understand the different types of laws in the different states. So several, well, I shouldn't say several, um, but it, more than a dozen states have mandatory drug testing laws that apply to every employer doing testing or, or in that state. Um, there are mandatory laws outside of those that apply just to specific industries. So some states have laws that apply just to healthcare. Um, West Virginia has a law that applies just to mining companies. Um, so there's mandatory all, then there's mandatory that are industry specific. And then there are laws that are what we call discount laws. There are about a dozen states that have workers' compensation premium discounts. And those laws say, if you want to receive a discount, and we're going to go through a couple and see, some of these can be big. So if, you're, you, know, if you have a high workers' compensation premium, this can be a significant savings. And the laws dictate what you have to do. Some say... Um, you know, you have to have policy, you have to have a medical review officer. Others are not that, that specific. So you really need to dig down into what the requirements are so you can take advantage in each of those states. But they are voluntary laws. And then the other type of laws are what we call at CCG limit of liability laws. And those are ones where if you do a drug test, let's say for an accident, you can deny workers' compensation payouts and you can deny... Um, unemployment payouts if you abide by those voluntary laws in those states. And so you really have to know the different law types and you have to make a decision in your organization as to whether or not you are going to um, abide by those policies if they're not mandatory. Some, some can really be significant in terms of the money that you can save um, in taking advantage of them. But if you are a multi-state employer, it's important that you understand you need to look at each of those different states. And likely your law, your, your policy um, for multi-state, you need to have state addendums that list um, the differences in the law than your general policy. So with that, we're going to hop back to West Virginia, and we're going to say mandatory drug testing law um, requires wit written policy and notice. And notice is generally 30 days, but you need to look in the individual state. Um, it specified that testing time is considered work time. So if you have a random program um, and you're sending somebody, you have to consider that as testing time and pay the employee. Confirmatory testing is required. The employees must be given an opportunity to provide relevant information. So you know, that's sort of code for use a medical review officer. Um, there is a split sample required. So you have to use split sample protocol, and the lab should know that when you contact the laboratory. And the employees must be able to pro be provided information about treatment. So if you have an employee assistance program or if you're connected to a SAP, you need to provide that for anybody 
in West Virginia. These now are some of the states who had impactful workers' compensation law changes. Um, so in Arkansas, they specified that if a worker is terminated and they're denied work and so worker compensation for a positive drug screen, they can no longer contest the test results before the Department of Labor. So that's one that we would consider sort of an uptick in protections for employers in Arkansas. Iowa, the law previously permitted the denial of workers' compensation if the employee was intoxicated and the intoxication was um, a substantial factor in the accident. But sort of read between the lines on that, there's still areas to contest that. And so the law was amended so that a positive drug test immediately following an accident basically provided the legal presumption that the person's intoxicated and the intoxication was a substantial factor in the accident. So really, again, how to apply that in a very general sense is now a positive drug test counts as intoxicated. We're going to talk when we talk about marijuana a little bit about the area of intoxication and impairment and how that's significant right now in drug testing. Um, Missouri had a change in 2017 where the law previously permitted workers' compensation denial or reduction if drug use was a factor in the accident. It's amended so that the positive drug test sort of becomes that presumption. So again, this is protecting you to say a positive equal um, uh, presumption of drug use. The drug test has to be done within 24 hours, however. So you can't go back three days later and have a positive for marijuana and apply that worker's compensation denial. Um, they have to have a, the employee notification and the opportunity to retest. Retest does not mean you get to take a new test. Retest in drug testing means you get to have that same sample that's frozen at the lab, sent to another certified laboratory and have it confirmed again. Um, and that the positive test has to be confirmed by mass spectrometry. So for those of you who are in Missouri and you're using rapid screening test technology, you need to make sure that those rapid screens are sent to a lab for confirmation or for retesting, okay? So really important if you're taking advantage of it. And then Wyoming sort of put a big stamp in a way on their voluntary workers' compensation insurance discount for their safety programs, and they said, the base rate goes from 5% to 10%. So if you're in Wyoming, you get a 10% discount on your workers' compensation at the base, and it can go as high as 30%. So they've really raised the stakes for people to start taking advantage of the voluntary workers' compensation premium discount law um, in that state. Some of the more miscellaneous drug testing law updates in Indiana they criminalized the distribution of synthetic urine or adulterants for defrauding a test. And so they can actually now come after an employee um, as a criminal offense for using some of the adulteration products that you can buy on the internet and in different retail outlets. In California, they changed the, DU, the mandatory drug testing laws for taxi drivers. They haven't really specifically stated if that's going to apply to sort of the Ubers and the Lyfts, um, but it is mandatory drug testing for taxi drivers. So if you're doing business in California you um, and, and you're screening, you need to know that that's now applicable to the employers, um, and they have to apply with the DOT standards. We're going to do the second half of today's webinar is specifically going to talk about what the new DOT standards are. And then in California, they, um, you know, sort of interesting because this goes along with them now allowing um, recreational use of marijuana. They did specify that the DUI law prohibits ingestion of marijuana while driving um, or as a passenger in a vehicle. So you're allowed to do it, you just can't do it while you're driving or you're a passenger in a vehicle. Um, Iowa, hair testing was added as permissible specimen for drug testing, but it's not for employees, it's for prospective employees. And if you're using hair testing or you're interested in using hair testing, it's going to apply what is a pretty industry standard where the, the um, 
the sample has to be shorter than one and a half inches long and it's limited to the portion closest to the hair. And if you think about that, it makes sense, right? Because someone who has long hair, the ends of the hair are going to show even longer use. So to be careful that you're not being um, hit with with discrimination laws against people who are in recovery, they're limiting you to about a 45-day window with that under 1.5 inches of hair. And they want it to be closest to the head because simply that's the most recent use. In Illinois, um, they stated that law enforcement agencies have to have a written policy regarding drug testing and it has to be within one hour of an officer involved shooting. Very few of you are in law enforcement, but that's um, applicable if you are. Um, they state written policy with almost no exception. Not only is a written policy a good practice, um, it's usually a requirement for anyone who's doing employee testing. Um, it's absolutely the foundation of any drug testing program. Now we're going to move into some new marijuana laws in 2017. And like we said in the beginning, it's the most active area. And it's the most important for you as an employer to be paying close attention to because there is a lot of gray area. The first area of gray is that it is still a Schedule One drug in the United States. And so in every law, there is gray area and you can be sued. It doesn't mean you're going to be, uh, you're going to win. It doesn't mean it's going to not be dismissed. But obviously for an employer, there's cost to even getting involved in any sort of lawsuit. Um, we are hearing a lot of employers questioning whether or not they should still be doing drug testing. And that's where there really is a catch-22. If you don't do drug testing, then you really open yourself up to a whole different set of risks, which are negligent hiring risks. Um, and uh, laws that you are in, you are knowingly um, um, not providing a public uh, I'm sorry a safe workplace, and so there are there's risk involved in that, and so we're encouraging people to continue drug testing and to sort of be cognizant and aware of the changes. Um, make sure that your policies are reviewed as a living, breathing document and they're updated and reviewed more than annually to, to a large degree um, so that you're making sure your definitions protect you as best as you can be protected with the changes that are happening. So in West Virginia, they were clearly active this year, um, but the West Virginia Medical Cannabis Act makes marijuana av available for serious medical conditions. And we're gonna see through these uh, medical marijuana laws that a lot of these are changes to which conditions and how you can take the marijuana. So in, in this case, it's they've made available for some serious medical conditions. I'm in Pennsylvania. They did the same here, and they list specifically which types of conditions um, count for medical marijuana. Um, they also said that, that the forms are other than dry leaf. So dry leaf is traditionally what you would use to vape or to smoke. Um, that's not allowed. Employers cannot discriminate, so they can't terminate, discipline, or conduct adverse employment action based on an employee's status as a medical marijuana user. Okay? Status. So what that means is, in many of these cases, you've got to be super careful listening to the law. What it means is, that you cannot say, oh, you have a medical marijuana law, a card, and so we're not going to hire you. You have to go through the process of drug testing. Um, employers can prohibit use on the work premises. They can continue to discipline employees for working under the influence of marijuana when their conduct falls below normal standards of care. And so influence in marijuana is a tricky, tricky thing. Um, in all states, there are what's called per se legal limits for alcohol use, right? But technically, you can show up to an interview drunk. You can be intoxicated. It's a legal drug in each of our states. Marijuana 
and how it metabolizes in the body, there isn't a drug test that can exactly equate under the influence. So the terminology of under the influence as it relates to workplace policy and safety is going to be a place where we're going to see a lot of active case law and a lot of active definitions in policy. Um, so in this case, they don't talk specifically about drug testing. So it appears that you can still discipline an employee who's a certified marijuana user, but it has to be a positive drug test, and then they have to show that they're, they were had lower standards of care or performance in their job. And so it's important that you look at both of those things when you're looking at terminating, and you can't just say the person had a positive drug test. So thinking about random drug testing, that's where you're going to be limited slightly in West Virginia unless you fall under federal standards. So you got to think about that. And But it has to be someone who's a certified patient. They can't go out and get the certification after the drug test. And it has to be for those specific um, reasons that are approved under the medical marijuana laws. In Indiana, they've established a program for patients for treatment-resistant epilepsy. Super specific. They do not mention workplace and they do not mention drug testing. And so this is really a medical marijuana law that's very specific. And they talk about cannabidiol. And when we get to the DOT section, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference of cannabidiol and THC because it's really important for those of you who are just really trying to understand this craziness um, and how things are changing. You really have to understand what cannabidiol and THC are. We're going to cover that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, if you think this is not coming to a state near you, I want you to think again. Um, this is the state of marijuana in the United States as of 2017. The states in blue have approved both medical and recreational marijuana. The white ones have no medical marijuana laws, right? Or I'm sorry, no marijuana laws right now. But you'll see when we look at what's active in 2018, a lot of them have um, laws that are under review in the states. It's also important to note that there's not a single state that has passed recreational marijuana without having passed medical marijuana first. So look at that state and you'll see that it's likely coming. We're now seeing where these laws are being refined. So in many of those states, they had medical marijuana laws. They existed. And now they're making changes to start to refine them. And that's due in part for those of you who are employers in these states, right? It's due in part to active participation with you and your legislature, giving them feedback that, this is confusing, and there are a lot of loopholes, and they have to get crisper, if that's a word, more crisp, in how these laws are written. So in Arkansas, the Medical Marijuana Act protects, it extends anti-discrimination protections to both employees, ap I'm sorry, applicants and employees. So what they say in this law is that an employee under the influence during the hours of employment or for excluded, it, it excludes them from working in safety sensitive positions, but it also says that the damages are, are limited for employment discrimination suits. So it's, as an HR person, you have to really look at the application of any other ADA claim. When someone is a medical marijuana card holder or certificate holder, depending on the state law, and they are using marijuana on the job or there's a concern that they are going to use marijuana during the, the hours immediately pro, um, before working or during work, you have to look at the safety sensitive nature of their job, safety, the safety of all employees, the safety of your data and the function that they're doing. And you have to really say, if they cannot perform this job that we have defined as safety sensitive, do I have to make ADA accommodations? And where and when can that employee work within our organization? You're going to see that throughout these different state laws that you have to look at the application of ADA laws um, now for medical marijuana patients. Um, in Georgia, they added new diagnosis and conditions where they can use cannabis oil, and they've included autism. 
And then anyone in the hospice program, regardless of the diagnosis, can, be, can use THC oil. Um, likely not to impact you in terms of workplace, the hospice piece, but it is significant for the autism piece um, that they can use THC oil. And so again, you have to figure out how you're going to accommodate that use. And I want everyone here to be cognizant of the fact that a legal definition of safety sensitive in your workplace can have far reaching applications. And that applies to marijuana as well as prescription drug use. You need to look at the job descriptions in your organization and see if you can apply safety sensitive job descriptions outside of what we traditionally think, outside of sort of the construction and transportation industry. You know, is there financial safety sensitive? Is there healthcare sensitivity? And so apply those and then your level of um, workplace drug testing and the level of accommodation you can make is different than some of the other positions in your organization. Really important for you to look at those. So when we move through some of these other laws, Iowa um, added some more conditions that apply for THC cannabis oil. Vermont increased the number of dispensaries and added more conditions that apply to medical marijuana. Louisiana protected the medical marijuana industry workers from arrest. And that's where you're seeing confusion between federal law, where you're not allowed to distribute, manufacture, um, grow, or consume marijuana because it's a Schedule One drug, in direct contrast to state laws having full industries where they're doing just that. Um, Maine had an, emer an emergency bill to realize that their law for recreational marijuana didn't specify that it was for adults 21 years and over. So they added that. They set a personal possession limit of five grams of marijuana. And then they transferred the authority for oversight to the Bureau of Alcoholic Beverages and Lottery Operations. So again, many of these states be, you know, don't know who's going to govern all these rules and the rules that are certainly in conflict with the federal rules. And so they're having to refine the drug testing laws that they just passed to make sure there's more clarity as these conflicts come up in their states. Drug de decriminalization laws, again, these are less affecting of workplace, but they do affect whether there's possession laws that are criminal um, offenses in these states. So Virginia decriminalized simple marijuana possession, Nevada changed their DUI, and so you can no longer have a urine test for the UI. They have to have a blood test. Um, if you have drivers who are operating company vehicles, that's where these things become important for you to understand. Oregon, they reduced the crime classification for certain drug crimes, crimes including the possession of Schedule One and Schedule Two substances. And in South Dakota, they removed cannabidiol. Again, we're going to talk about what that is. They removed that from the definition of marijuana and they added it to the Schedule Four controlled substances. So it means it's sort of a lesser drug in terms of how damaging it can be, and that's how the schedules go in South Dakota. There were some significant case laws. Those of you who have not looked at Barbudo and Advantage Sales and Marketing, it's important that you do it. So these laws and these cases, or I'm sorry, these cases specifically look at employers, the application of those ADA rules, and discrimination for just being a card holder or a medical marijuana certificate holder. So you want to look into those cases like Barbudo and see how you have to apply the use of a card holder status versus um, the application of drug testing in the workplace. And then again, how you have to apply ADA when it, when it comes to marijuana use. Um, Calligan versus Darling Fabrics, or Darlington Fabrics in Rhode Island. The gist of this law was that the disability laws in Massachusetts in Rhode Island protect medical marijuana users who have a qualifying disability from being fired or not hired, so read candidates, due to medical marijuana use unless the state disability law requirements are met. 
So the employers have to engage in that interactive process to determine whether the disability has an impact on their ability to perform their job. Um, and even though drug testing is still permitted, you have to take the, you, you know, you have to go through that interactive process with somebody through the ADA to see if there's any additional um, uh, steps or precautions that you have to take before you discipline or terminate or refuse to hire an employee um, based on that new case law. And so you'll see those as themes as we're seeing these marijuana laws pass. Your need to know which um, which types of ailments apply, you know, the person can't go out after a drug test or after notice of a random test and go get a card and become a card holder. So you have to know how that's going to apply. Make sure that's in your policy. And then you have to really brush up your skills on ADA and what you have to do to make reasonable accommodations and if and when that's going to be applicable in your workplace. So now we're going to get into the HHS and the DOT updates. And we don't have tons of time. And so we're going to cover it. Um, knowing that you need to go into this into in detail. But both the HHS and the DOT made changes. They are very similar, but they're not the same. The Department of Health and Human Services is, is a, applies to all federal executive branches and their agencies and their drug-free workplace programs. But the agencies under them don't have to apply, don't have to um, conform to them. They can, but they don't have to. The DOT, as of January 1, does now apply with most of what the HHS um, rolled out. And the most specific thing is that they added four semi-synthetic opioids um, and into their drug testing panel for the DOT. And the DOT, remember, has all of the different agencies under it, like um, the you know, the truck drivers, the FMCSA, the FAA. So it applies to all of those. And the full regulations are here. You're going to get copies of this recording, but it's 49 CFR Part 40 is the Department of um, Transportation's rules. And then each of the agencies have their own regulations underneath that. Um, so it applies to all of those agencies. Um, it aligns with the federal mandatory guidelines. It reinforces um, that urine is the only specimen allowed for drug testing and that saliva and breath are the only specimens allowed for alcohol. Um, the HHS, we'll talk about it a little bit, but I don't want to cover it in too much detail, mentioned that oral fluids is allowed. It's likely going to happen in the next 24 months, um, but it is still not allowed under DOT programs. There's 14 changes. Um, all of them are final, and you know they do go through the comments because there was a long comment period. They do go through the comments if you care to look at them to understand why they made changes and what the impact of that change was going to be. Um, the panel change, the most significant part is you'll see this on your reports now if you're an employer. The wording has changed. So opioids accommodate Senate, the, the synthetic and semi-synthetic opioids. So they've added, added the ones that you're hearing about in the nightly news, right? Hydrocodone, hydromorphone, oxycodone, and oxymorphone. So it's still a five-drug panel, but there's a lot more sub-drugs under each of those five drug categories. And then they've added MDA as an initial test analyte. That's under the amphetamines category. And they've removed MDEA. Um, again, if you don't change it, it's not a seven panel. It is a DOT five panel, and it's going to remain the same. They made a change like this in October of 2010. This is the same sort of thing, but it's still going to be referred to as a five drug panel. Um, opiates, if you don't know the difference, those are sort of the natural ones. And and you know, I've had comments after these webinars. You got to understand, I'm applying this all to to a pretty broad audience here. So heroin is technically synthesized, right, out of opium. But in general, this is sort of the more natural drugs that are derived from opium, morphine, codeine, heroin, opium. 
the semi-synthetics are the ones that are being manufactured. Um, the methadones, the Percocets, the Lortab, Vicodin, the Lauded, those are the ones that have been added. Those are the ones that are being so highly abused right now. The MRO verification process has changed, and it's important that you pay attention to some of this. So under the DOT, they are now stating that a prescription means a valid prescription, but it's super significant in the fact that in, in two different ways, right? The prescription verification allows the MROs to, I'm, I'm sorry, allows the DOT, they were reinforcing that marijuana in any form is still a Schedule One drug. It is not allowed under the OPT program. They're not going to talk to you about being a cardholder. They don't care. If you're in a DOT position and you present a medical marijuana card, even if it's in a state law and, it, and it's an allowable um, ailment, the DOT says, we don't care. You can, it doesn't matter, right? Um, they can also, a, the MROs can request a THCV test. So we have a slide coming up on this, but um, THC is prescription use of marijuana um, under using FDA cleared drugs. The MRO, if they are suspecting that someone comes up with a um, prescription for Marinol or Dronabinol, we're going to explain what they are. They can run tests and they can see if the person has a valid prescription, but they're using over-the-counter drugs that are given out by a dispensary by ordering a THCV test. As a DOT employer, there's added cost. And you have to allow the employee or allow the MRO to order these tests at their discretion. You cannot insert yourself and say, we don't want to. You have to let the MRO order those tests. And they're going to do it because they're going to try and verify the use of a prescription drug. And so the FDA has approved drugs. Marinol has been around since the 80s. Dronabinol, um, they're synthetic 9-tetrahydrocannabinol. Um, and so they've, they've had these and they can test and see using that THCV test if it truly is Marinol or Sesamet or if it's not. And so that's going to be important as you move forward to allow the MROs that latitude. What they also changed, though, is that the age of the prescription and DOT program is not defined. And so that's where it's going to get a little bit tricky, right? So in a DOT program... The MRO can't say, all right, this is a three-year-old prescription for um, oxycodone. They're not allowed to question an employee's doctor if they believe the doctor prescribed a legal medication too liberally. They can't say, I think you're crazy, doctor. You know, you shouldn't have given her a 30-day supply of, marin or of, of, of oxycodone. What they are allowed to do, though, is to give a safety warning. And so if you're an MRO employer, you've got to really understand what that means because they can look at me and I can provide a prescription in a DOT setting that's 10 years old and the MRO has to accept it. But then they can say to you as an employer, there's a safety warning. I have concern that this person, even though I'm giving you a negative drug test because I have to overturn it based on her 10-year pres old prescription. I have a safety concern. And then you, as an employer, have to figure out what you're going to do because the DOT regulations do not say specifically what you do when you get a safety warning. But it certainly gives you higher risk knowing that you're putting someone behind the wheel who is possibly misusing a drug. So you really have to be careful to understand how you're going to do that outside of your DOT policy, how you're going to deal with safety warnings. And then as an employer who follows the DOT rules, you need to understand that you most often can limit in a non-DOT program the length, the, the age of a prescription. So in a non-DOT program, you can say, if it's over a year old, we are not going to accept it. And we're going to tell our MROs not to reverse the drug test and to report it to us as a positive. So it's super important to look at the role of the MRO and safety risk if they're going to downgrade a test 
which they now can do, they're going to downgrade it and then they're going to report a safety risk. So you're going to get a negative and then you're going to get a safety risk. And you have to understand that they can report in a DOT program medical information without consent of release by the employee. Okay, so sort of complicated to cover on one slide and quickly. Um, so, it, you know, write yourself a note to go back and to understand how that applies and what you're going to do from a policy perspective. Some of the less heavy stuff, there's some new fatal flaws. So, you know, if you're a DOT employer, understand that they're going to come. It's a fatal flaw and understand that in most cases for a fatal flaw, you're going to have to retest the employee. Um, they've added, um, sorry, I went through that one quickly, but they've added four. Uh, there were four fatal flaws. They've added three new additional ones specifying what to do and that it's a fatal flaw if there's no chain of custody. Um, if there were two separate collections performed using one chain of custody, and if there's no specimens submitted, um, but there was actually a specimen collected. So they're going to talk to you about all of those different fatal flaws, and then you have to apply what should be your existing um, procedures. Just know that there's three additional ones. Um, they changed what a collector can do when there's a questionable specimen, and they just added clarity that they can discard that they should discard the specimen previously collected um, and then the MRO only has to report the outcome of the one test because that was confusing for employers when they would you know sort of get one and then they'd have an observed collection and have a second specimen coming in they've clarified that for collectors they've removed blind specimens so if you're on the phone and you're a large employer who was subject to working with the with Orange Tree and submitting blind specimen, they've removed that. But I want to assure everybody that that does not mean that they removed any requirements. There's still stringent requirements for the laboratories that are happening through the National Laboratory Certification Program. That, but they've just removed it from the burden for employers to have to do that. They've required that anybody involved in the process on this end, right, on the, on the industry end, the MROs, the BATs, the SAPs, are um, part of the ODAPC list serve so that we get updates via email and we don't have to all carry around big copies of the DOT regulations and be able to prove those under audit. So seems simple. If you're an employer, I suggest you also sign up because it's free of charge and it just keeps you in the loop. Um, and then they've, like we said, clarified um, the specimen types. Nothing changed. They just reiterated that urine specimen is the only drug specimen allowed um, and that saliva and um, breath are the only alcohol tests allowed. And then they've reiterated that DNA testing on a urine specimen is not allowed. They just reinforced that. That's not a change. Um, what's important to know is that there are actually 20 different states. So the DOT law doesn't apply to the states, but the states very often reference the DOT, the HHS, or SAMHSA in their laws. So it's critical for you to talk to Orange Tree about those different states and make sure that your panel change is reflective of it. So it's mandatory that you're using this new HHS panel in Kansas and in Louisiana. In Puerto Rico, um, it, it's a little bit different. It's mandatory that in Puerto Rico and Kentucky that they have uh, the state-specific drug panel requirements, but they say that they have to, they have to adhere to the SAMHSA standards. Um, so it, it's a little bit of a nuance. You want to talk and figure out what that means. So you don't have to alter the drug testing panel in those states but all of the other changes apply. Um, in the voluntary laws, so again, if your company has these voluntary laws, if you take advantage of those discounts, Alaska, Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, um, the Missouri Unemployment Compensation denial requirements, you have to look because they all have their own nuances. So. Alaska only mentions the DHHS SAMHSA in a few elements, but not through the entire program. Um, 
Some of them have like a major impact. Some of them have a more minor impact. So you've got to look at how they reference the um, HHS or the SAMHSA or the um, DOT laws and make changes to your uh, your policies. Um, and then there are, like we said, industry-specific mandatory laws. So Illinois Public Works, Virginia um, Mining, and Wisconsin Public Works all reference the HHS guidelines. And so you have to look specifically at those states and the laws and see how they apply to you. Um, action items. If you thought we covered a lot for 2017, get ready because 2018 is geared up to be even busier, right? I mean, I kid you not, you cannot turn on the morning news, the night news, open a newspaper and not hear something about medical marijuana, legalized marijuana, recreational marijuana, or opioids and the drug opioid epidemic in any state. I'm right outside of Philadelphia. Philadelphia just today and this week, um, you know, ha has had heavy talks about having shooting zones where um, addicts can go and have safe zones for shooting because we have the highest opioid overdose um, uh, statistics in the country. And so they're really struggling to figure out what do we do until we get this thing under control. So 2018 is geared to be even more active. Um, you've got to look at the mandatory laws. If you have not looked, I can say this, in, in years past, I said it and sort of said, you should look at your policy. I can almost guarantee you that if you have not updated your policy in the past 12 months, it is out of date and you're out of compliance. So you need to look at the mandatory laws, the industry-specific laws, all of those voluntary laws, um, and then the DOT laws and how they apply to each of those and update your policies. You need to get active. Like I said in the beginning of this, um, the laws have a lot of gray area, right? I mentioned that I was going to say the difference between cannabidiol and THC. We're seeing a lot of laws that reference cannabidiol. Cannabidiol is one of the active ingredients in marijuana. It is the one that is most often tied to these issues that are being prescribed, mar uh, being prescribed medical marijuana, but it doesn't get you high. It's not psychoactive. So we're seeing laws that are specifically related to cannabidiol, the production and use of cannabidiol, and then THC, that is psychoactive, that does get too high. So you have to even be careful in different laws and how they're applying. So, you know, if you're for testing of marijuana to see the uses of cannabidiol, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be higher impairment in your state because it doesn't get you high. So you really have to do your homework and study it. You need to contact your lawmakers and get active because, again, all of the taxpayer dollars, um, that, that, you know, everybody's seeing stars in their eyes and billions of dollars in taxpayer revenue that these states are going to reap. They're not going in your pocket as an employer to fight the law suits that are coming um, to deal with the accommodations, to deal with the higher risk. And so you really have to get active and understand these laws because the burden of the impact is going to fall to you and the burden of the cost over the next 20 years is going to fall to you when you're, you know, fighting these cases, when you're dealing with the higher health care um, rates because you're seeing, you know, higher COPDs because people are smoking in your state. Um, you're seeing higher accidents. You're seeing higher workers' comp claims. You got to get active. And so we encourage you to get active and to be very vocal in your state. And then watch what's coming. So New York has one of the most broad-reaching laws that's under the third, it's being read for the third time. And what they're saying is a marijuana positive on a drug test by a medical marijuana user cannot be the basis of a hiring decision or disciplinary action, right? So this is medical marijuana, not recreational 
but it's really important because it is starting to infringe upon your rights as an employer to do pre-employment candidate screening. Um, and then again, it talks about impairment, and we talked about that a little bit, and you gotta understand that super hard to define impairment. There's no per se legal limits. And so because of that, you've got to be specific in your policy and say, this is what we consider impairment. And then you've got to hope as these court challenges come that the states start to define what impairment means and how you can identify it. You need to look at the different drug testing methodologies and see how they apply. So hair testing, for instance, is going to, you're going to have a hard time proving impairment with hair testing because it's a long look back. Oral fluids window of detection is much shorter. Urines is a little bit longer. You want to think about that when you're developing your policy and you're doing testing in your state and figuring out how that's all going to apply. Vermont, this is the first time they're legalizing recreational marijuana for persons 21 years or older. And as of yesterday, this passed. What's super important is this was legislative. So this wasn't a, a the, the, the people raising and presenting a law, this was the legislature for the first time saying, we are passing it. We're not listening to you in the state and saying what you want. We're doing it. That's important because it's a first and we're likely to see many more of those come down in 2018. And then finally in New Hampshire, they've legalized uh, recreational marijuana. So, you know, California is the biggest one. We're going to see the impact of that. Look at the stats for the states that have already recreation legalized. Um, and now what you're going to start to see is people saying, oh, gosh, what have we done? Right. They're seeing the impact of the higher um, the, the, the higher accident rates, um, the higher workers comp rates, the higher health care rates. And so as we're seeing different states legalize recreational marijuana, you want to apply what you're seeing in the state. And they've issued great reports in Washington and um, Colorado the statistics and start applying them to California and that's going to help you predict what's coming down in 2018 in terms of the costs and the impact in the states where we're seeing the recreational marijuana. So we got about five minutes, a few minutes left, I guess, maybe not even five. And I do see one question. Um, if you have more, you can let us know, but let's at least see what that one question is, Suzanne. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Nina, for that really helpful, really relevant information. Um, I do see a question um, in the chat. And just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, either put that in the chat um, or uh, please raise your hand and I'll be sure to unmute you. Um, but the question I'm seeing is, um, would you advise changing our non-DOT five-panel drug test to a DOT lookalike panel? Um, it's a really good question. If you're in a state that requires it, obviously the advice is simple, yes. If you're in a state that doesn't require it, then it is absolutely something to look at, but you have to be really aware of what we talked about with the reversal and with the prescription validity timeframe. So understand that if I have one pill for one legal opioid, in one year, then I can generally go about using and possibly abusing that drug. And so the drug test isn't the only thing, right? If you're going to change the panel, because there is a huge impact, we're even seeing workplace overdoses on site increase. If you're going to look at changing the um, panel in those states, then you also want to look at employee assistance programs, recovery programs, and specifically what your panel is going to um, do if the, the MRO notifies you that um, they, they're, they're concerned that there's use beyond a normal medically prescribed use. So I advise strongly that if you're going to make the change to align with that panel, you really use it as a time to think about your whole program overall um, and think about, you know, drug testing as a component of a safety program and as a component of an employee assistance program 
and as a component of your healthcare and recovery and wellness program. Perfect. I think that um, we had a question submitted uh, in advance of the webinar that I actually think you might have just uh, touched on, Nina, um, about modifying policies to be more broad or more specific. And um, maybe you could yeah, expand there, what your thoughts would be. There are great programs available to employers. Some are through, you know, your health care coverage and their employee assistance programs. But many of those are just telephonic services um, that, you know, you, you can use, your employees can call and they get a call-in service. Um, those are oftentimes not sufficient for what we're talking about now. There are a lot of programs available that are truly employee substance abuse professionals. And oftentimes, you as an employer, can develop relationships with those providers. And I can certainly work with you know, the team at, at, at Orange Tree to help you know what some of those are. But these are, are you know, they're SAP providers for DOT regulated employers, but you can expand your relationship with them outside of just safety sensitive employers. And you allow your employees at their own cost, right? It doesn't have to be at your cost to contact a substance abuse professional and to be assessed. If you're looking at it as an additional benefit, then you can often say, look, we'll pay for the first session um, for you to go in and be assessed. Um, and then they can provide treatment. They can provide, you can look at, um, you know, recovery treatment and con continued testing programs. There are really strong statistics in recovery that show that if you have an employer-sponsored program of testing once you've come back into the workplace, once you've come back from being in a treatment, an inpatient treatment program, if you um, have a program where you continue to test, that you have a much longer-term success rate. And so when you're looking at your programs, I think it's a really good time to look at those things um, and to actively make, retain these good employees that you've invested so much in training um, and giving them outlets for recovery and for continued treatment and su success. You know, because you drug test does not mean you have to have an, a... a you know, a, a, a no tolerance policy. We're moving into an age where we're looking at maintaining healthy employees and, and supporting them. And so, it's, uh, you know, I'll allow room for another question before we end, but it's important that you look into those programs when you're looking at your overall policy and provide those different types of outlets to your employees. Um, so we did have a couple questions about um, receiving the slideshow as well as the recording for the presentation, and we will definitely make those available after the webinar. Um, I see one question here. Um, since 2018 will be an active year, where is the best place to find uh, changes or additions to drug testing laws? Um, well, you know, work with Orange Tree. They're very active with CCG. CCG. Um, we, we do have what we call leg up, um, and you can go on to currentcompliance.org, or you can go on to uh, current consulting, and you can sign up and get those updates. Um, Orange Tree is a member of NAPBS. NAPBS also provides a Thursday newsletter that gives active updates in terms of um, drug testing and background checks. Um, and then there are DASHA and SAPA. Those are organizations for the drug testing industry, and they also provide updates. So those are, you know, the ones that I'd recommend for you. Um, and then Orange Tree often does do informational webinars that are specific to, you know, changes in legislature. And we notify um our clients, and you know, Orange Tree is one of them, when there are significant changes that come about, and they in turn will notify you. So lots of different ways to 
to stay involved because it does change all the time. And and the person who asked that is in Pennsylvania, and that one is one that's really going to change quite a bit over the next year. So, and 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 by the way, also that ODAP C listserv. If you're a regulated employer, sign up. That's a free one too, and it gives you a lot of information on the DOT, and and that's important for you to get updates on too. Well, it looks like we're right at the top of the hour. Um, thank you so much, Dina, for your really helpful and insightful, uh, very knowledgeable presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I'm seeing thank yous in the questions. So uh, sounds like the audience definitely appreciated that. Um, any final thoughts? No, just we appreciate that Orange Pre brought us on to do the webinar for you and and everybody for staying on and staying active for that whole hour. I know webinars sometimes are a little hard to stay attention to, uh, pay attention to, and so we appreciate you staying on. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. -bye.